The following presentation is an exclusive interview with the world-renowned founders of the International Centers for Attitudinal Healing, Dr. Jerry Jampolsky and Dr. Diane Serencioni. Together, they have founded over 100 Centers for Attitudinal Healing and taken this concept to 54 countries around the world. Do you want to find happiness through a new approach to life? Watch this show and share in an in-depth explanation of the 12 principles of attitudinal healing and discover a path of fulfillment and inner peace. These 12 principles can heal wounds and negative patterns and turn your world into a joyous experience. Let's explore with Dr. Jampolsky and Dr. Serencioni as they personally describe this effective set of tools that can help you to experience life as fully and as peacefully as it can be starting right now. Welcome to Healing in You. I'm Dr. Shintani and I'm here with our special guests tonight and for tonight's show we have a very special show for all of you. Uh, we have in the studio my uh, esteemed guest Dr. Jerry Jampolsky and Dr. Diane Serencioni and uh, just by way of introduction uh, Dr. Jerry Jampolsky and Dr. Diane Serencioni started the Centers for Attitudinal Healing. Uh, for their background, Dr. Jampolsky uh, started the centers back in the 70s and uh, in 2005 for all of his work he won the American Medical Association's 2005 Excellence in Medicine and Pride in the Profession Award, which is a prestigious national award. And uh, Dr. Diane Serencioni is a, a clinical psychologist who has been working with the Centers for Attitudinal Healing uh, for almost 30 years. And uh, Dr. Jampolsky is a Stanford trained uh, psychiatrist and has been working uh, on this for most of his career now. And I actually met him back in the 1970s and I was so impressed with his work. And uh, uh, well, I should have been back then because since that time they've opened dozens of uh, centers and groups in 28 uh, countries on five continents. And I understand that they've done work uh, with attitudinal healing in 54 different countries. It's an incredibly impressive uh, resume that they have. And uh, for all of their work in 2006, they at the World Health Awards, they won an Integrative Medicine Award. So welcome, Dr. Jim Polsky and Dr. Diane Serencioni. It's a pleasure to have you on the Thank show. Thank you. Great to be here. It's wonderful to be here. Um, for the audience, could you explain a little bit about what attitudinal healing is to, uh, so that so that the audience has an understanding of what your uh, teachings are based well, on. Well, attitudinal healing is based on the premise that it's not people or conditions or situations outside of ourselves that cause us so much distress and unhappiness, but it's our own thoughts and attitudes that cause this. And attitudinal healing has to do with letting go of the blocks to love, blocks like judgments we make on ourselves of condemnation or that's what we make in other people and how we interpret people's behavior, uh, acting as gods to decide whether they're lovable or not. Uh, Attitude healing is really based on healing the illusion that we're separate from each other and that uh, it's possible to find inner peace even when there's chaos going on all around us. And I guess I would add to that that uh, attitudinal healing is a psychosocial spiritual model that um, uh, it is, is non-denominational, but it allows one to recognize that in any given moment you can choose peace over conflict. You can choose love over fear. It's a way of retraining your mind within the context of your own cultural traditions. That's why it's been accepted in so many countries. It's, uh, it's wonderful that uh, your concepts have reached all the way around the world. And uh, from my own perspective, I found that it's uh, oh, oh, pretty much identical to the Native Hawaiian healing traditions and it's a f it's a formula it's a recipe for inner peace and world peace wouldn't you say that that, uh, that has uh, that has an important uh, role to play well I think peace needs to come from within ourselves first and as we learn to let go of the things that interfere with our peace that are self-imposed then we can begin to see the world differently and bring, have minds that join to bring peace to this world. And we're very optimistic that that can happen. 
That's great. Um, I just wanted to let the audience know that I met uh, Dr. Jampolsky uh, in the 1970s. He, get a, he gave a presentation here in Hawaii, and uh, the title was Attitudinal Healing, and I wondered what that was, and I showed up, and I was thoroughly impressed with him, and uh, I used to make pilgrimages to his center in uh, California uh, so that uh, I would be able to rejuvenate my uh, my my interest and my uh, faith in the concept of healing one's attitude. In fact, I know you don't like to talk about it much, but a lot of people have healed themselves of physical ailments once they heal their attitudes. Isn't that right? Well, that does happen, although that's not our goal. Our, our goal really is to have inner peace. And indeed, uh, people have been blind and been healed, and many different diseases have been healed. But the real aspect of our work is to help people, uh, whether they have cancer or other very catastrophic illnesses, to know that they can find a sense of peace inside, no matter what's happening to their body. And, and I might add to it before we go on to that, so that our listening audience realizes that attitudinal healing, unfortunately, it's not about healing somebody else's attitude, although right. I'm sure we all have like <laughs> a long list of people whose attitudes we'd like to heal. It's really about healing your own mind and your own heart and taking full responsibility for everything that you think, everything you say, and everything that you do. And from that comes the possibilities for real, true inner peace. And one of the things that I, I know you don't like to talk a, a whole lot about it, but in doing so, when people heal their own attitude, they find that their whole uh, person uh, begins the process of healing. And there have been some instances of reversal of cancer, mm -hmm. uh, reversal of other chronic uh, so-called incurable conditions once they heal their attitude. Isn't that right? Haven't, haven't you seen yeah. that? The other part yes. of attitude healing has to do with our relationships. Uh, if a person can be dying of cancer and uh, morphine's not working, and oftentimes it's not working because that person is still holding on to some unforgiving thoughts about themselves or other people, and we find that it, when one opens up the possibility that they're looking at their relationships and they heal the relationships, that the drug begins to work and the pain medications begins to work. So it's a very simple but very deep and what we call our work is really practical spirituality we're not religious we're not involved with churches or uh, and things like that but we are involved in two spiritual principles that can really change our lives in very dramatic ways well since yeah i was just going to say that there are people from faiths from all over the world though right. that use attitudinal healing and because it doesn't interfere with their belief systems and whether it's at a catholic christian judeo uh, islamic hindu we all, all all have used attitudinal healing and actually that the, the the principles are so universal and yes. what I wanted to do was just go over the 12 principles of attitudinal healing and just get your brief description of what the principles mean. Um, let's go through them 1 to 12, one at a time. Um, the first principle listed is the essence of our being is love. What does that mean? Well, that means to me that uh, we're more than just these bodies. Our bodies are really not our true identity and that uh, we're really light beams. And uh, the more that we see that and believe that, uh, we begin to communicate differently w with the people that we're communicating with. And if we see that we're brought here to heal ourselves and heal the world, and we can do that by forgiveness, we can, there's a one-liner that I like using that I wrote a number of years ago. It says, if we said this to everybody silently or verbally, your light is all that I see, and it's but a reflection of the light in me. That when we practice forgiveness and practice seeing the light in each other, what happens is that we bring more light to the world and a lot of the darkness begins to disappear. That's great. Dan, do you want to make a comment? I don't know if I can make it better than that. I think we'll just go on to number two. <laughs> okay. Number two, the, the second principle of attitudinal healing, health is inner peace. Healing is letting go of fear. 
Well, it's another way that we, um, another way of looking at healing other than the traditional medical model. And I have to say that uh, beginning with the work uh, in 1982 when AIDS was named at San Francisco General Hospital, um, these principle, this particular principle has been a saving grace for physicians, nurses, healthcare workers around the world. We did 10 years of AIDS education work in 30 countries, Jerry and I. and, oh, and uh, Physicians, certainly starting with San Francisco General, the first residential hospital, were were just absolutely getting completely depressed because everyone they were working with was dying, and um, so their goal, of course, was to try and keep someone alive, and they were being proven a failure every day. And so, what this particular principle, health is defined as inner peace, healing is the letting go of fear, really gives them another goal. The goal is inner peace. And so I've worked very closely with AIDS, uh, persons living and dying with AIDS for a number of years. And I have seen people in their last moments of life, when their body is completely wrecked, when they are some of the healthiest, most healed human beings I know, because they have found inner peace and they have been able to let go of their fear. And that is, it's a profound experience. So it's really another way of looking at the world. And Jerry, you might want to add to that since that's such a... I think you did a great job. Okay, all right. <laughs> <laughs> See, after 30 years, what this does, we're just in complete agreement. <laughs> right. Okay, we're moving on to the third principle of attitudinal healing. And this is one that I really uh, love because it's so Hawaiian. And that is, giving and receiving are the same. What does that mean? Well... If I take out $5 from my wallet and give it to you, I have $5 less. And what we're talking about is the essence of love. When we give love to another person, that love is received at the same time. When we believe it's a part of the universal love, part of the love that really created us. Not the ego kind of love, which is more of a trade or a bargain. But when we really are in a consciousness of giving our love unconditionally to another person, that love is, comes right back to us. And that's what that really means. Dr. Diane? Well, you know, I think that the, these principles, I just want to point out to our listeners and our viewers that they sound really simple. And they are, but they are not easy. They take a lifetime of mastery. And the uh, concept of giving and receiving um, as therapists um, it's, it's used very commonly by many people doing therapeutic work and realizing that the person who has come to you is going to be your, going to teach you, is give you as much as you're going to be giving to them. So you're in a place of receiving as well as giving. Not just the monetary exchange for your professional services, it's so much more than that. So every being that we meet is someone that we can give to and someone we can receive from. But this giving is not giving to get like the ego would have us do. Right. It's giving with no expectations. It's giving with really unconditional love and absolutely no judgments about the person we're giving it to. And let me finish what uh, the, st the uh, concept that you, were, you were saying, uh, how you take out a $5 bill and if you give it to me, I have $5 more and you have $5 less. But when, it's, when you're giving love and you give me love, you actually, we both have more. And that's one of the beauties of this concept. All that I and give, I give to myself. Yeah, right. And, and then it's a love that continues to right. expand on itself. All right, that's great. Okay, uh, the fourth principle of attitudinal healing is we can let go of the past and of the future. What does that mean for people? Uh, I think it's sort of a reality check. That The reality is that the only moment there actually is is the present moment and now that moment is gone and now we're in the present moment again and although we experience love in the past we can't currently experience that love we have to experience it in the moment and the, the, the future is something that we sort of make up in our own minds it doesn't really I mean where is the future it's not like hiding under this desk or in a vault somewhere so the future as it as it the most we can do I think is respect it and plan for it so when it becomes the present it doesn't turn into chaos and so the ability to be able to be consciously stay in the present. I don't know about anybody else, but it's really hard for me. <laughs> I've been working on it for years, but I'm getting a little bit better at it because my mind will naturally drift to the past and get stuck in something or to the fear of the future of what will or will not occur. And in that, then I completely lose the present. Andrew Lee has to do with a lot of belief system. 
and our minds are really split. Part of it's an ego mind, and part of it's filled with love, unconditional love. And that part of the ego mind states that the past is going to repeat itself. So we begin to experience a fearful past, and we begin to say, well, it's going to be spread into the present and spread into the future. And uh, we become very fearful about that, and then we feel that some people do things that are unforgiving. So attitude of healing is really based on the premise that there's nothing that's not forgivable. And that forgiveness really allows us to erase the past, or else our friend Bill Thetford once said, it creates celestial amnesia, letting go of everything except the love that we've received and giving that love of love to other people. Okay, that's great. Okay, principle of attitude, attitudinal healing number five. Now is the only time there is, and each instant is for giving. What does that mean? Well, many people with cancer are living in fearful of the future. Am I going to live? Am I not going to live? Uh, what's the doctor going to say tomorrow? Uh, based on my statistic, uh, the doctor says I have to think I have cancer for the next 10 years. Uh, what it really means is that if we live in this present moment as if it were an eternal moment, and our purpose here is for joining and to be a beam of light and a beam of love to other people, that we can be peaceful. When we start asking questions about the future, we start getting caught in the future or caught in the past, and we lose that peace because it's like an old dream that's being re reunited to in the present. We, it's just an old dream that we re we replaying. So it really means learning to say, I'm going to live one day at a time. I'm going to live one moment at a time, as if this is the only moment, a moment to feel in the consciousness of giving love. When I'm giving love, I'm going to feel peaceful and I'm going to be happy because it's not other people or my body that's going to make me happy. It's my thoughts and decision that I will be happy because that's my natural state. Diane, do you want to add to that? No, I have nothing to add to it. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move on to principle of attitudinal healing number six. We can learn to love ourselves and others by forgiving rather than by judging. Well, what does that mean? Well, we certainly uh, have lots of self-condemnation of, ourse of ourselves and judgments about others. And I think there's a human being alive that doesn't do that at some point in time. And I think the more conscious we are about the fact that we are doing it, it sort of like becomes really obnoxious when you think of how many judgments you're making. I don't mean objective evaluations. I mean judgments, that somebody ought to be different doing this, whatever. And, and so I think that it gives us the opportunity um, every day to say, um, am I here to love or am I here to judge? That's Forgiveness is really yeah. the, the basis, the core of all attitudinal healing. And if we could live our lives one moment at a time with the purpose of giving our unconditional love and constantly making forgiveness as important as breathing, then what happens is we begin to feel that peace that would have been avoiding us. And, and I might just emphasize too that the forgiveness we're talking about has nothing to do with um, uh, permissiveness, agreeing with horrific acts, condoning someone's you know horrible behavior, because we see forgiveness as an internal experience, and uh, and ultimately it's it's also forgiving ourselves for the judgments we have about someone else it doesn't mean that people aren't responsible for what they do because they are it doesn't mean that they shouldn't be held responsible for it because they should this is about how do you find peace of mind inside yourself how do you get to that place where you can let go of your judgments and then ask that inner guidance ask spirit whatever your belief system is what do I need to think say and do about the situation does it also mean forgiving yourself for thing, mistakes you've made? Well, so that's certainly a large aspect of it, because I think it's hard to forgive yep. someone else if you haven't forgiven yourself, because if you haven't, it's usually a projection that you're projecting off onto someone else unconsciously and thinking it's about them. So I'm not going to forgive them, because ultimately I'm really not forgiving myself. Yeah, I think that's an important aspect, because people think of forgiving as just forgiving others, and then they forget to forgive themselves for things that they've done. Exactly. And I think that helps to gain inner peace as yeah. well. And Jerry wrote a beautiful book called Forgiveness, the Greatest Healer of All, which right. I highly recommend. I, I recommend that too. Perception is really a mirror, not a fact, as Diane was saying, that oftentimes when we see someone else and we're finding fault with them, it's something in ourselves that we don't want to look at. So indeed, healing ourselves is what it's really all about. 
Okay, let's go on to principle of attitudinal healing number seven. And that is, we can become love finders rather than fault finders. What does that mean? That's a profound statement. Well, let me just give a quick example of that. Uh, some a number of years ago, I was seeing a, a woman who was just about ready to, to leave her husband and get a divorce. And she had this long list of faults that she found in her husband. And I suggested to her, why don't you, before you make your decision to go to your lawyer, just spend one week at just being a love finder. Let go of all the other things that you thought of about fault. And then come back and let's talk again. And at the end of that week, she came back and said, you know, I know it wasn't my husband that changed, but things are all different because I've changed my attitude. <laughs> he sure looks and, different. I remember she said that. <laughs> yeah, she said. <laughs> so yeah. um, being a love finder is really a very important thing. It sounds very simple, but if we go through the days of seeing people either as loving or fearful of giving us a call of help for love, then we can do that. Even if it looks like a person's attacking us, we can say, hey, that person's really fearful giving me a call of help for love our heart will automatically open up. I think it's important too to, to maybe take a moment and say there's absolutely no room for denial in attitudinal healing. Mm -hmm. Often people will say, oh yeah, but you're just like covering up your mind, you're not seeing. I says, no, actually not. We haven't been asked to come and work in 54 countries and see some of the most horrific things that have gone on in this planet for nothing. It's to look at them and then to still be able to see the essence mm -hmm. of love within human beings. And so it's not, a, it's not about, it's about really seeing, looking at it, and then choosing to see differently, to see more, to expand what we're looking at, and to look through the lens of either love or fear. And is that part of an, uh, of an extension of what you were saying is that, what was it you were saying, the light that you see in the other person is a reflection of yeah, myself? Exactly. Your light is all that I see. It's a reflection of the light in me. I think that's a really important statement, actually uh, kind of you find it expressing itself in some of the other uh, principles right. in, the, well. in the mini course for life which we wrote together and um, at, that's the last the number 18 Jerry wrote that one actually and uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful principle that's great I might mention that the, there's a website uh, a couple of websites that oh, we can uh, miss them now or at the end too www.attitudinalhealinginternational.com uh, Dot org yeah. or ahinternational.org. Jerry Jampolsky.org. Right. Jerry Jampolsky.org. Right. 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 Uh, so if, if the viewers or the listeners want to find out yes. these uh, uh, these principles of attitudinal healing, uh, they can go to those yeah, websites. Find them on the website. Yeah. And, and there's a local website. It's uh, Attitude. attitudinalhealinghawaii.org. Correct. All right. Uh, okay, we're, we're down to... Uh, Number attitudinal healing principle number eight. We can choose and direct ourselves to be peaceful inside, regardless of what is happening outside. This is like a core tenet of attitudinal healing, um, that you get to choose the reality that you experience. And, and I think of an example of, we've worked in, in, in Croatia and Bosnia during the war quite a bit, and there are centers there, and there was a professor who went from Croatia over to Bosnia every day to the university, even though at the risk of his life. And on one day the university was being bombed, and he was down in the basement with, with these students, and they had one candle in the front of them. And he, he was a student of this work, and he went, maybe this is that moment that I, can I choose peace right now in this moment, knowing that I could be blown to bits in a second, even though there's chaos going on all around me. And he said it was one of the most profoundly peaceful moments of his entire life. And all the kids joined him, these young students joined him in that. And so yes, at any given moment, I can choose to be peaceful on the inside, regardless. And again, it doesn't mean I'm denying it. I'm actually looking at it. That's the power of this work, is you look straight at it, and then you make that decision yourself. And it's like, I actually am in control of how I am experiencing the world. Boy, that's a moment for the ages. Oh, to, it's incredible to, when you do it successfully. If you can, feel, if you can yes. be peaceful in the midst of war. Yes. But Diane, uh, there are a lot of people out there listening today uh, and tonight that uh, will think that, uh, what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> I just lost my job. And uh, I don't know well, what's going to happen in terms of uh, yes. my payments in my car, my, my home I think I'm going to lose. 
uh, I'm angry, and uh, how can I feel peaceful when all those things are happening to me? And uh, what I would like to say to the listeners is that, uh, yeah, that's human uh, to be angry, uh, but I ask everyone to say, to say this, do you really want to feel peace of mind? And recognize it is a choice, and that you have faith that somehow that this problem will resolve itself, and that you can feel peace regardless of the form of the world that you're facing right now. And I find that many people who've lost their jobs are, are beginning to volunteer at uh, places, soup kitchens and other places while they're looking for their jobs. And they're feeling better about themselves because they're, they're not just saying, poor me, I'm a victim and getting stuck in anger. So uh, it's really important to experience the anger but not get stuck in it. Really important to honor the feelings. Yeah. So that, again, there's no room for denial. The question is though, do you have to stay in that? And sometimes people feel, I'm just a victim of this. As long as I don't have a job, I have to be miserable. Well, no, you actually don't. Exactly. Wow, that's great. That's And how relevant that is at times like this. And by the way, if people can feel p peaceful in the midst of war, boy, an economic downturn is nothing compared to that. I think what we forget is it's a choice, that we have a choice. We choose what thoughts we put in our mind. We choose what attitudes we put in our mind. It's always a choice. Right, that's great. Okay, principle of attitudinal healing number nine. We are students and teachers to each other. What does that mean? Well, I think it's that interchange, uh, kind of like giving and receiving in a way, except it's so much more on the human basis. And it's the realization that every single human being that you meet can be a teacher of something. At the Centers for Attitudinal Healing, um, that even the smallest child has the same thing to teach you as Dr. Jerry Jampolsky. It may not be the same material, it may not be in the same context, but if you are aware and open, there is learning all around you. And likewise, we all turn into teachers, too. It just is a constant flow back and forth. And in the role, again, as a therapist who's had a practice, sitting there with clients that come to me or working in the state hospital, as I did here in Hawaii in one of my internships, or in back at UCSF in California, in my postdoc work, working with clients, is realizing that every single person that's coming to me is this gift that's coming. And if I don't learn something from them, then there's something wrong with this picture. Then I just think I'm doing something to someone else. And I don't believe that. I just think that they're having an experience of me and vice versa. And I want to gain the value from that. And hopefully they will too. So it's how you hold the consciousness when you're with another human being. And, that, and aren't some of the most profound lessons learned from children? Well, in our experience. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, there's this one child that we were taking a walk with, uh, Diane's uh, grand nephew, and he's yeah, four, year, four years old, and sees a bunch of um, weeds there, and he starts to play in the weeds, and pulls one out, and smells it, and touches it to his cheek, and tastes it, and comes over, Diane, Jerry, isn't this the most beautiful thing you've ever seen in your life? And what a, what a beautiful teacher, Buddha, this child was, to remind me, do not look from the past and superimpose it on the present. See, everything is beautiful, no matter what we're looking at. And uh, so children, indeed, that's how we started the center. I gathered around nine children who were facing death with cancer and asked them to come in as equals. Uh, I had an idea that maybe we could support each other. And, uh, and uh, because I think I love them to call me Jerry, and I saw them really as my teacher, we bonded in a whole different way, and uh, they helped made the decisions what night we're going to use, be and what we're going to do. And uh, there's something different when you approach a child as spiritually enlightening, a spiritual teacher, as you would someone who was in their 90s. And uh, so we really feel uh, that's very important. And our work really started by a one-liner and a little child to lead them. Uh, you know, children are very forgiving and look at a newborn baby. Uh, you see the innocence in that child. You can remind yourself that's, that's part of you. And they're in the moment. They're in right? the moment. They don't and they're know, not looking at the past. Or they the don't future. even know how to tell time, so they're, they're well <laughs> off about, about that. They don't care what color their parents are or what religion they are or what their past is. And their real teachers love them, and they're so bright, they know that the best kind of love is that which you don't even need words for.
Well, that's wonderful. And and actually, that's influenced me in my uh, practice because I I keep remembering that. So when I do my programs, I always tell uh, my participants that uh, it's a privilege to work with them because I'm learning from them as they are learning from me. It's a it's a wonderful concept, and that was. Uh, we are students and teachers to each other. All right, number uh, principle of at, at, principle of attitudinal healing number ten. We can focus on the whole of life rather than the fragments. Well, we live in a busy world where the world seems like a jigsaw puzzle that's thrown up in the air, and they're all fragments. Uh, whether it's a pimple on your nose or whether uh, someone uh, didn't invite you to dinner or whatever that might be. And uh, when we concentrate on the whole, for me, that means we're, we're concentrating on the whole of love, that, what, the, the love that joins us with each other. The ego is always going to be in fragments and trying to find fault and look at uh, how things are impossible in a, in a world that's unfair. But when you choose to see things as whole, and anyway, and everything's connected to each other. They're all part of one, we're all part of the oneness. And I've always felt that attitudinal healing, where we feel that your attitude's everything, allows us to experience that oneness that makes us allow us to feel that sense of peace and happiness that's in our heart. And takes the picket fence that many of us put around our heart because we've been hurt and worried that we're going to get hurt again. Right. Diane? Okay. You know, and a lot of times people, they, they focus on one incident and they're really upset with one thing and it, it, bec it becomes their whole life. They, they forget about all of the good, all of the other aspects of life just because of one wrong that happened to them. Or well, I... Terry, this is true for, for famous authors that I've been involved with. Uh, they may have a bestseller, but one paper criticized them and they concentrate on that and they're just right. terribly unhappy. Right. Exactly, and then they forget the wonderful work that they did otherwise. Yeah, I think a beautiful example of what Barbara Streisand said in an interview one time. She said, I can look out on the audience and everyone's absolutely adoring, but when one person gets up, they could be going to the bathroom for all I know, but they get up and they walk out and I am freaked. Oh, you know, man. And, and here's someone who was so incredibly, you know, amazing. And the top and, of and who field, has no reason And to the feel very best, absolutely. <laughs> but see, I think we're all very human. Right. You know, but one of the beautiful things kids teach us is that you know, th they really don't hold on to grudges a long time. Kids could be fighting like crazy, you know, in a playground or something, and then they, you know, then they don't talk to each other, but like about three minutes goes by, and like, that's really boring. Yeah, you know, exactly. then they go, they, oh, we need somebody else. Okay, come on over and play. Right. And they're, they're really good teachers of forgiveness and that's staying great. in the moment. Okay. Principle of attitudinal healing number 11. Since love is eternal, death need not be viewed as fearful. Well, that's a biggie. Uh, my parents were always afraid of death, and they taught me to be fearful of death. And I remember as a young adult, I used to fantasize, well, I'm going to get one of those, be in one of those frozen things, so when I die, that some guy's going to invent something someday, and I'll come back, and I'll be alive and walking all around. And uh, children have been wonderful teachers to me uh, to learn that uh, they were not just these bodies. I remember one child who was dying and no more drugs were going to be used and he participated in that decision and came to a support group where I was the facilitator and, and one of the kids said, hey Greg, what's it like to know you're going to die in a couple of weeks? And while I was trying to think of what can I say to bring about a sense of ease here, and Greg just started to talk and said, well I think when you die, you just discard your body which was never real in the first place. And then you're at one with all souls, and sometimes you come back and act as a guardian angel to, to some person. And there's no question in my life that this Greg acts as a guardian angel for me and for Diane, and is with me every time I pray, every time I meditate. And uh, so there's another way of looking at, at death, and uh, seeing this as a costume that we let go of, and what stays there is the light that, that joins us completely. And I think you, you can find that in, in most traditions also, the continuity of love and, and connectedness after the body, after we leave the body. Um, and I think that this principle and, and all of attitudinal healing gives us the opportunity to learn to really live our dying. 
you know, I mean, we're dying from the moment we're born. You've heard that said but that's before. A, that's but amazing is that a statement because that's what Mitsaoki, a oh, legendary, oh beautiful Mits. oh my gosh, uh, legendary yes. minister a great here. teacher to all of us, right, Mitsaoki, a, a, a great a teacher of death and dying. Yes, he yes. He used to say that exactly. Yes, same we've thing. worked with Mits. We should and, be uh, live. We should be li living our dying. Living our dying, absolutely. And attitudinal healing lets us recognize that that death is not the end of life. And of course, many of the religious traditions also teach the same. Unlike Jerry, I was raised uh, with um, in a family where there wasn't a fear of death. My mother was never afraid of it. And now she's at 90 and she's really not afraid of it. <laughs> and it shows in her attitude and the way that she's lived. Um, but this principle has really helped being with people who are in such traumatic experiences and, and situations who are afraid of dying. And actually, if if you lose the fear of death, what else is there to fear? Well, that's, it. that's, that's the biggest fear that we have. That's why right. the first principle of the essence of our being is that we're not bodies. Our true right. identity is, is really the essence of love. And so all these 12 principles start to intertwine and they begin do. to support each yeah. other. Well, if yeah. you do one principle, well, you can be healed. You can, <laughs> have, a, you can have inner peace. Especially the first but, one. But they all, they all are part of the same ball of wax, same heartbeat. That's great. Okay, we're down to the twelfth principle of attitudinal healing. That is, we can always perceive others as either extending love or giving a call for help. What does that mean? This is a big one. Yeah. Well, um, in one of my books, Love is Letting Go Fear, there's a story about uh, going to a restaurant and the waitress is just snotty-nosed and abrupt. Uh, drops coffee on you and is rude and uh, you want to go to the owner and complain and uh, someone tells you uh, that uh, her husband died two days ago and she has five kids home all of a sudden you start looking at that situation differently and uh, you can see that she's fearful giving a call of help for love so I don't think we have to analyze everything what my friend used to say analyze and that what we can do is no matter what kind of communication come, has come there, if the person doesn't appear to be loving, just to know that they are fearful and they're giving you a call of help for love. That can do more to heal relationships and bring peace to our minds than anything I know. And I think uh, Jerry and I, between us, um, we've, we've certainly been raised on the diagnostic manual of all uh, mental illnesses, etc., as everyone in the, in the the mental health profession has been. Um, and reality is though that, you know, we really narrow it down to these, these two areas. That you're either, you know, experiencing yourself as love and giving it away, or that you're experiencing yourself, or you're experiencing fear. And so, f under fear is anger, rage, violence, all the horrific things that we do ourselves and to each other. And it, it allows one in a moment, in a moment, to be able to shift your consciousness and when you see someone who is attacking you, attacking and verbally attacking work or whatever it is, that in any given moment I can shift instead of, if I see, if I see this person as just as attacking me, then what am I going to do? I'm going to attack back. And this is how we go back and forth. But if I see this person as fearful, something shifts in my consciousness. Where I, I don't think that I would ever attack someone who I saw as fearful. So it brings up something different within me. And it could be a mother-in-law, it could be people that we have challenges with in our lives, no matter what it is, to see when someone is acting out, to see the underlying premise of what's happening here is that this person is afraid. And what is the greatest fear? You know, we talked about in principle number 11 that the greatest fear is the fear of death, but underlying the fear of death is the common fear in all situations. And that is the fear of separation from something or someone whether it's our losing our job or our position, uh, or someone we love leaving us, um, one of our children dying, our parents, whatever it is, it is of the fear of lifestyle loss with the economic situation. It's always the fear of separation. So, so to help ourselves when we're in stress is, is to ask the question, what is it that I'm really afraid of being separated from right now? And then dealing with that. Terry, uh, a few years ago, Diane and I were invited to give a talk at the the state mental hospital in Kaneohe. And uh, I think about 200 people were there, all in uh, kind of surgical gowns. Half of them were patients and half of them were staff. And you couldn't tell who's the patient and who's the staff. 
pretty important kind of thing. It's a very thin line, oftentimes, of what we think uh, is who's crazy and who isn't crazy. Uh, our friend Hugh Prather, an author, stated that if we all had TV sets here and everyone, you could see all my thoughts that go out, and everyone, everyone did that. Wow, we would clean up our act pretty, 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 uh, pretty quickly. And I've often thought if I was given the opportunity to rewrite this thick book where psychiatrists and psychologists make diagnoses and tell them what it's all about, it'd be one page, one line. And you know what it would say? It would say that we're insane when we're not experiencing ourselves as love and giving that love away. Wow. Now, if you look at that one <laughs> definition, it would say most of us are kind of insane most of the time because we're not there. We're all the, we spend so much time judging and there's very little time for loving. We Boy, have very was, uh, we're very selective who we think is lovable. So I think we have to let go of who's lovable and who's not lovable, that we're all born lovable. That's how we were born. We're born with that essence of love, with compassion, with kindness, with gentleness. This is what we really are. And attitude healing is just learning to let go of the blocks that interfere with that. Boy, that would shake up the field of psychiatry if they did that. It really would. <laughs> I might just add that, you know, uh, having worked at the at the state hospital, um, it was really an extraordinary experience here in Hawaii. And um, actually, Jerry, wasn't such, they were wearing aloha outfits that day. And, you know, they have a halau up there. <laughs> or they did at the time that is both of patients and staff, too. And you can't tell who's who. And it was really quite beautiful. And I, for having been on the inside there, I know there's also lots of years there's criticism of the hospital or whatever, but uh, I, it's an incredible group of dedicated people and I, it was an extraordinary experience of love one I'd never trade. That's great. I'd like to say a little something since um, I'm 85 about aging with attitude. <laughs> and, uh, you get to do that uh, Jerry. A couple years ago I was uh, at a birthday party with a large birthday party I was asked to say some words and I mentioned uh, he was, my friend was 60 years of age and I said 60 is a wonderful age because you no longer care what people say about you. But when you're in the 80s, it gets better because you can't remember what people said about you. <laughs> so how we look at things, how maybe it's important to count our smile wrinkles rather than our aging wrinkles. And there are all ways to shift our attitudes about what's going on. We can see everything that happens to us in life can be a new lesson that brings us closer to oneness, closer to that which created us, closer to eternal love. That's wonderful. Um, we've got a few minutes left, and what I wanted to do with the remaining time is just hear one story from each of you of a person who was influenced by these principles and turned their life around, or something that, an, an example of, uh, of how the attitudinal healing principles may have affected someone in a positive way. Well, I remember a guy by the name of Jerry Jampolsky. <laughs> he, really, he really got affected. Who, who, who uh, was scared, quite scared most of his childhood and didn't pass grades very well because he was the bottom of the class. Uh, turned out to be an alcoholic uh, and uh, collected friends who were alcoholics so I could deny I was an alcoholic. And uh, had a lot of years of therapy and psychoanalysis and still was uh, pretty depressed and pretty unhappy and uh, learning about changing my mind can change my life changed my life changing my belief structure that nothing is impossible nothing is impossible so you you really turned your own life around using yeah, these principles exactly. well, that's of course why you teach I'm still it. doing it every day <laughs> and and actually you know that's that's I think it's important to know that uh, none of us are perfect, and we have to work at this, right? Oh, yeah, we're working that's process, right. that's for sure. Yeah. We just seem to have a little bit more fun lately. <laughs> <laughs> Not take ourselves so seriously. Yeah, right. You know, um, and I, the story that came to my mind, I mean, there's so many, but one is a, a beautiful person that uh, we came to know um, from Idaho named uh, Zelinda um, Caruso. And now this is Linda Caruso Luger. And her, she had four sons, and her son worked in a bar. And um, late one night, a casual acquaintance came to his home and killed him. The person mm. was also under the influence. And it was very painful and very bitter. And this man went to prison and was in prison for, you know, eight years. And, and she, every time the parole, he came up for parole, she did everything possible, of course, to keep him in prison. And um, then she came across, actually, it was Love is Letting Go of Fear, I think, uh, Jerry's first book. And um, just realized that maybe there's another way of looking at this, because in that 
those condemnations in her own mind and heart, her health was starting to go, her hair was falling out, she was getting a, a skin disease and uh, so much pain in her own life and she had, she finally got to the point where she was so miserable she said there's got to be another way um, and so what she, the guidance that she got was while she was praying one day was to go see the prisoner and she went there is no way I'm going to see this person you know I want to see this person rot you know for the rest of his life and then when he dies he can go to hell you know and but she kept getting it and so finally she went and talked to went to the prison and she was able to get you know in to see him long story short at first she said you know this isn't about you this is about me he was afraid of her because he thought she was gonna hurt him and they gradually came to understand and to see and to know each other and then she started to see some good things in him and then she started to see how imprisoned his parents were also and uh, that they had lost their son and gradually in time the short version of the story is that she went to finally to one of the hearings and asked for him to be released and the guards had tears in their eyes I and mean, nobody could believe this happened and the day that he was released she met him at the prison. She took him in the car and drove him home to his parents and returned wow. him to his parents. He then married, had children, um, and um, she has stayed in touch with him over the years, and he has a life that is really worthwhile. Forgiveness is a powerful, powerful tool, and attitudinal healing was the way that she found that. Wow, that's an incredible story. Uh, how much more time do we have? We have about six minutes. About I'd like then to raise some questions by me. Okay. Uh, and that is uh, to the audience. Um, like, what would happen if everyone, including the blisters, would wake up in the morning and say, today I'm going to go through this day determined that I'm not going to hurt myself or other people with my thoughts or actions? What do you think might happen to you in your, in your own peace? What would happen if you really believe that's not people that hurt you in the past that's hurting you, but it's only your own thoughts and attitudes that you're experiencing right now about those things. What would happen to you if you really believe that? What would happen if you stopped interpreting people's behavior to decide who's guilty and who's innocent? What would happen instead if you became a love finder rather than a fault finder? What would happen if you did that last lesson the twelfth one where you each day said, today I'm only going to see people as loving me, whether they're fearful, giving me a call of help for love. Can you imagine how you might shift gears in terms of the sense of peace, the sense of harmony that you might have with yourself and with others? What would happen if you stopped judging yourself? You know, about 50% of people have not forgiven their parents. They're blaming their parents for all the bad things that are happening to them. What would happen if you totally forgave your parents? And those of you who are divorced, about 75% of people that are divorced have not forgiven their spouses. What would happen if you really felt that forgiveness is the key to your happiness and peace? Sometimes those kind of questions can really help us move in a whole different direction. Right. This, those are great questions for people to ponder and uh, give them an opportunity to apply the 12 principles of attitudinal healing. Um, I just wanted, we have a, a little bit more time. Could you, could you tell, I wanted this on record because I, rem I remember it. Could you tell the fishing pole story? Well, we both played, played, played a part in that. Go ahead, Jerry. Well, Diane was uh, writing a book her first book that hadn't been done with us jointly, and uh, she looked all over to find the best illustrator in the world. Turned out it was 20 minutes from where we were. And I'll use a fictitious name, John Smith, and, and she said, gee, I used to have a patient by the name of John Smith. He was a little kid, around seven years old, and uh, his father was in San Quentin prison, and I saw him about six months, and, and then the, uh, I remember I, when he was, had his birthday, I gave him a small fishing pole. And my office was way out in the water and on a dock, and we'd go fishing with each other. And um, uh, I said, gee, I, I, can I go with you, Diane? And Diane said, yeah, it's okay. And we went out, and it was the same guy. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? He had two children now, eight and one ten. And we spoke for about 
two hours together, and he did a he was going to do a painting for Diane without charging him, which is around five thousand dollars, you know. And after two hours, we were just about ready to leave. And he said, "Could you wait a few more minutes?" And I said, "Well, sure." And I cry every time I think about this. Um, he um, came in with this little fishing pole that I gave him since he was, when he was eight years old. That's amazing. And how many years later was this? Oh, this is oh, he was th forty. 30, he was forty 30, then. Thirty-five yeah, it's years. Amazing. And it was just it's a gift to me to remind myself. The little gifts are just as important as the big gifts we give. Right. And you never know which little yeah. gift is going to change somebody's yeah. life. And the other thing we haven't mentioned so far is that if each of us, our attitudes would change about life. If each of us started the day counting our, our, our blessings and things that we're in gratitude for. And uh, some of us, many of us have a big uh, list of to-do things. What happens if we have a to-be list? I'm unconditionally loving, I'm kind, I'm gentle, I'm going to be helpful, I'm limitless. And if we start that day with that kind of feeling about ourselves, we're going to go sailing through the day without going in a circle. Say that again. So people should have not only a to-do list, but, but a to-be list. I, I think, think that's profound. I, I think that the be list is more important than any kind of to-do list, because the to-do list has to do with our bodies. The to-be list has to do with our spirit of who we are and what we are, reminding ourselves that we are spiritual. I think that's wonderful. And Wait. if you look closely at this hat, it says, what is spirit? Because that's what it's all about. We are spirit. We do our to-be list every morning before we get out of bed. You know, and I'm reminded here, too, of what we've been blessed to do a lot of work with Mother Teresa over the years before she died, and, and with her sisters, uh, uh, missionaries of charity, who use attitude and healing, a number of them have. And Mother used to say, it's not how much you do in life that counts. It's how much love that you do it with. And attitude and healing helps people remove the blocks to the awareness of love's presence in our life. And that's L with a capital L. Can you say love. that statement again? It's not so much. It's not so much what we do in life that counts, or how much we do in life that counts. It's how much love that we do it with. Boy, that's a, that's a wonderful, boy, that's an incredible statement that uh, everyone should take home. It's a take home lesson uh, for, again, for the ages. Especially in the busyness of our lives. Right. We're getting busier. <laughs> All of us. Okay, we have about two minutes left and I just wanted to uh, just kind of wrap up. I wanted to thank you, Dr. Diane Serencioni and Dr. Jerry Jampolsky. Uh, my, actually, my, my old friends now. I've known you for many years now. Right. Um, with the Centers for Attitudinal Healing. Um, can you Tell the us websites? about the website yes, certainly. so that they can get information about attitudinal healing. Right. Well, the global website is uh, www.ahinternational.org. That's AH for attitudinal healing, ahinternational.org. And your local site here is www.attitudinalhealinghawaii.org. There's a Center for Attitudinal Healing here, uh, blooming and uh, looking for you know lots of volunteers and folks to help. Right, and, and if people uh, want to assist with the Attitudinal Healing Project or learn about it uh, in Hawaii, attitudinalhealinghawaii.org, just spell that all out. All right, I think we're, uh, we're running just about out of time. I wanted to thank uh, you for coming down all the way from California, actually from around the world, and I wanted to thank our, our producers and our camera people for uh, putting this show together. Uh, this is Healing in You Radio. I'm Dr. Shintani uh, for Dr. Diane Nomura and Dr. Ruth Heydrich, the other co-hosts of the show. Uh, I want to thank you all for, for listening, and uh, I want to say good night and God bless you all. Thank you for viewing and listening. For more information about attitudinal healing, go to www.ahinternational.org. And for programs and support groups in Hawaii, go to attitudinalhealinghawaii.org. Once again, for information about attitudinal healing, go to ahinternational.org. And for programs and support groups in Hawaii, go to attitudinalhealinghawaii.org. We thank you for watching, and we wish you the best of health. <laughs>